Hello, everyone, and welcome to Creative Campfire. This is the third in a series of first fires, our first stab at bringing the arts and culture community in New Hampshire together. We are sharing this space in order to create experience, experiences, hear from our artists across the state and generate interest and care across sectors. My name is Amanda Whitworth and I am the New Hampshire Artist Laureate. I am a dancer and a mom, a lover of early hip hop music and a frequent collaborator. And I'm joined here by my co-host, Robin Marcotte. Hello, everyone. As Amanda said, my name is Robin Marcotte. Uh, I'm a physical theater artist. I'm a queer rights advocate. I'm a dad. I'm an educator. And I'm a secret lover of Corvettes. <laughs> I can't wait till you get your Corvette. I know you're going to take me, me for ice cream. <laughs> it's going to be good. It's going to be great. So tonight, we are so excited. This is near and dear to my heart. And there are many people who uh, I love joining us tonight. Our episode tonight is on dance and poetry. We call it word dance. And we are joined by a variety of writers, movers, people who are coming to us from all over the state of New Hampshire or with ties to New Hampshire. We run our campfire in this format. We start by the kindling. The kindling is what Robin and I are doing right now. It's a welcome, a call to action, and let's get moving and going. We move into what we call the spark. Spark are inspirational performances or talks or tours of artist work or gallery spaces. We move into the fire, the heart of our series, where the New Hampshire State Council on the Arts joins us to give a fast blast of information and keep us up to date. And then we enjoy the warmth. The warmth is a curated conversation around a topic or theme. We invite field experts to join the artists um, in an informal conversation. And then we end with some s'mores. We'll keep you up to date on what's next and make sure you know how to engage with all of the panelists and performers you see tonight. So we are going to move right into it. And Robin is going to introduce our first set of performers. Thanks, Amanda. Yeah, so first up, we have Jeff Stern and Kelly Diamond. Jeff, at the beginning of the week, we asked Jeff uh, to describe himself in five words. Obviously inspired by the first taste of the warm weather, he responded with breakfast sandwich in the sun. Oh, the beauty. Jeff is a writer, he is a filmmaker, and ed an educator, and he's making collaborative art on the Hampshire seacoast and teaching at Bentley University. He is performing an original work titled Someday This War Is Gonna End. Kelly Diamond is a dancer, a rolfer, a dog mom, a hiker, a ceramics enthusiast living in Concord, New Hampshire. She is a certified advanced rolfer and rolf movement practitioner with her own practice called the Diamond Rolfing and Movement. She is a freelance dancer, performing and teaching across the region, primarily with Ballet Misha. Take it away, guys. Yesterday, I sat on my front porch in a rocking chair in the sun and didn't do anything for a while. I let myself feel the perfect balance of strange and normal, two heavy but equal weights on the scale. Eventually, the balance shifted and strange got heavier, and I went back inside to help my second grader set up his Zoom meeting. Everything is part of everything now. The boundaries are gone. It is horrible, peaceful, terrifying, reassuring, tragic, and comic. We are at home, at work, at school, on a date, in a movie, underwater, in the sky, trapped, liberated, doomed, saved. It is unlike anything we have ever experienced, and it is very familiar, and we can't believe it has come to this, and we knew it would come to this. We all see that same picture everywhere we look. The gray, fuzzy ball that looks like a cat toy, and the red, spiky flowers that are sprouting from it. 
it follows us like the moon shadow in the song. And if I ever lose my mouth, all my teeth, north and south, the gray fuzzy ball with the red flowers hangs on the wall in all the rooms and all my dreams. The gray fuzzy ball with the red flowers is the ball that Mookie Betts in Dodger Blue, California's sun, should be crushing into one of the alleys and left right about now. The gray fuzzy ball with the red flowers is the base of the snowman my kids are building. It is the stop sign, the sweaty coaster underneath my third drink of the night. It is the heads of the people on the Zoom call. In film, we call this a graphic match. If this were a movie, it would be terrifying and boring. This movie would not be greenlit. I keep thinking about Robert Duvall in Apocalypse Now, the only man standing on a beach as hundreds huddle in fear of the bombs and bullets that fly around them. Duvall, shirtless and alpha, crouches down to address a group of terrified soldiers. We think he's going to offer some encouragement or strategy, but all he says is, someday this war is gonna end. Yesterday, I sat on my front porch in a rocking chair in the sun and didn't do anything for a while. I let myself feel the perfect balance of strange and normal, two heavy but equal weights on the scale. My neighbor's New Hampshire flag rippled in the light breeze, a basketball hoop stood guard, a bird demanded everyone's attention. He was clearly conveying something urgent to whoever would listen, like the velociraptors that learned to communicate with each other in Jurassic Park. They're smarter than they look. I sit on my front porch in a rocking chair and don't do anything for a while. I let myself feel the perfect balance of strange and normal. The sun is lower in the sky, a red rubber ball stuck in a tree, a dot on a projected death graph, a sweaty coaster underneath my 400th drink, an adventure 65 million years in the making. Everything is part of everything now. The boundaries are gone and maybe the boundaries were never there. It is horrible, peaceful, terrifying, reassuring, tragic, and comic. We are at home, at work, at school, on a date, in a movie, underwater, in the sky, trapped, liberated, doomed, saved. It is unlike anything we have ever experienced and it is very familiar and we can't believe it has come to this and we knew it would come to this. I let myself feel the perfect balance of strange and normal, two heavy but equal weights on the scale. The flag ripples, the hoop stands guard, the bird insists. Eventually, the balance shifts and strange gets heavier. And I go back inside to help my second grader set up his Zoom meeting. Someday, this war is gonna end. Thank you guys. Thank you very much. That was incredible. Uh, Amanda, uh, let's have you take it away and introduce the next act. Great. I am introducing Liz All and Anthony Bompakoma. Liz All is a poet, teacher, bourbon lover, poker player, an itinerant Navy brat turned homebody living in Holderness, New Hampshire. She is a professor of English at Plymouth State University, where she collaborates on interdisciplinary curriculum and art making. She will be performing her poem, A Sharp Pencil. She is joined by Anthony Bompakoma, who is an artist, mover, life lover, entrepreneur, and kid who dreams big. He lives near Exeter, New Hampshire, and is a dance instructor, mentor, filmmaker, and owner of the Block Dance Collaborative. Using dance as a portal for storytelling, Anthony works with kids to inspire self-confidence and self-worth. Take it away. A sharp pencil. The sublime pleasure of a perfectly sharpened pencil, but also the sharpening itself, the scraping off, the shaving away of layers, the rending of lead to dust, but also 
the shavings themselves, the accumulated nest of tinder in its plastic box or in its gunmetal cylinder because also the pleasure of the vintage sharpener bolted to an ancient desk for leverage, a solid feature of the office industrial landscape. And of course, specifically, the dial with its gradient circle of apertures, each circle a perfect match for a slightly larger pencil, but also the pencil, that pencil grasped in your fat little hand, the first pencil, the biggest aperture the first lines and curls and crosses of language, of finally rendering your own strange signature, the spark of signification, that sublime pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> I always, the smell of erasers is something that is never going to leave me. It's from elementary school. Thank you for that. Robin, I'll kick it over to you. So next up, we have uh, Mike Nelson performing and Nick Betty Nagel. Mike Nelson is a dad, a writer, a painter of bees, a maintenance guy, and is still stuck in the 80s. He lives in Portsmouth, New Hampshire where he served as the Portsmouth Poet Laureate from 2017 to 2019. He's a generous collaborator, and Mike has been bringing poetry to diverse audiences through festivals, classes across the state, and classes across the state. He performing his original work, Corona Love. Nick Betty Nagel. Nick is a fitness freak, a dancer, light, life changer, and free spirit. He is founder of N Squared Dance Company that originated in New York City and travels around the country for performances and residencies. Nick is a freelance fitness and dance instructor working across Central and Southern New Hampshire and is a district manager of Ar Ar Arbonne International. Take it away. Corona love. A corona is a halo of light ring of fire of solar explosions, aura of a holy person, steady burn of the only love we've ever known. Quarantine is a lazy pattern of slowly bouncing off the walls. Now I would trade a lifetime of hugless safety for one warm, deadly embrace. The virus erases all borders. No wall can mitigate its migration. Segregated just out of reach by six feet of air, confined to the cages of our homes. There's no change without pressure. As the crushing gravitational fusion of hydrogen lights our star, so does the gravity of our situation break our hearts to forge some new element. We can't go back to the way it was. That was the path that led us here. Cleaner air and water around the world gives us an answer we've been looking for. The drama, thriller, horror, comedy of this moment can't be watched from the couch. Re-enter the wild world, rubbing our eyes in the sun, like newborn bees emerging from the honeycomb. The nurse and the grocery clerk are all of us. Despite their masks, I see them more clearly. The corona glow around their holy heads. The steady burn of the only love that's ever mattered. Thank you. Amanda. For our last poet-dancer duet, 
I am introducing Alex Perry and Maria Ambrose. Alex is a mindful writer and a professor and a poet residing in Londonderry, New Hampshire. She is a professor in the English department at Salem State University and serves as the New Hampshire Poet Laureate. She will be performing in hallways made of dashes from her third book, Control, Bird, Alt, Delete. Maria Ambrose grew up in Meredith, New Hampshire, and now resides in New York City working as a dancer with the Paul Taylor Dance Company. She has toured and traveled extensively and is now back in New Hampshire with her family due to the pandemic, but we're glad you're home. <laughs> Maria describes herself as a dancer, cat lady, massive Prince fan, longtime boxer, and lover of anything in the mountains. Take it away. In hallways made of dashes. One, in hallways made of dashes and hyphens hallways that are parallels to my living and loving because I could hear on the other side of the wall great voices reciting in large voices of passing subway trains. Now my living is running toward my loving shouting, what a bargain! Because in a maze with blinking doors and numbered choices, tiny clay flower pots hiding the footnotes, and icons hibernating at dead ends. I made my way, that little symbol I, and could monitor my progress. 25%, 50% done, completed. My avatar, the size of a cursor and flailing its bell-bottom legs and arms. It pauses beside cloth begonias and squirt daisies, avoids the man reeling in footprints the white ant that patrols a row. Function, F12, my little eye, I jump the wall. I make more maze by breathing, by adding code, HTML, a fret design, a Greek meander, which is the figure of a labyrinth in linear form, by breathing. Two, I jump the wall and land on colored phrases. I jump and land in a dumpster in the alley because there are more forms to fill out. A dumpster of mannequins and foam columns. I have to punch my way through giant we're number one hands to get through this part. Reset, press again. I jump and land on colored phrases that tell me how to move like in a game of twister. Commands, streets that tell me how to move in a series of streets that are directives because those streets had been brought inside. In a labyrinth carved out of nostalgia, a warren of personal names, I touch the street and more streets unfold beneath it, drag my club foot onto it, my mouse hand, in a vortex of splinters and piers, a deer path, and to an alley of men who play backgammon off their chests and drink a soup of nuns. My avatar is running. Up ahead, more forms need to be filled out, a mandala of blanks with low ceilings and boxes color-coded with chandelier. Three, at work the next day, a few feet inside the symbol, standing first on a stop sign red phrase, then a tangerine warning, looking for the yield yellow whilst thinking to myself, I had heard about the legendary hand-tinted hallways of, I knew I had to operate manually. As I said to my friend, the darkness surrounds us. After the lights went out on the floor, I peered over my wall. Kilroy was here. On every screen, the low ceilinged rooms of data entry, whirl of cubicles like partitions in a fingerprint. I had to operate manually. I spent one floor 
thinking over how I treated others, another on how I'm living my time. All the contemplation I put off was in this color blown in from a faceless name. Jewel-toned hallways to boardrooms of chairs made by chance, tables by weather, and guards with the acne-scarred faces of pugs in ornamental corners on even-numbered floors, insight, awareness, compassion. On odd-numbered floors, a gold prow turned the corner just as I saw it, near the maw of the open elevator, after the copier machine. I saw myself on a security screen as a stick figure in a fuller plan of dashes, rooms without floors, doors in ceilings, in the stairwell, HTPP emerging onto the roof of the building, waving for rescue. It is not the described experience of the poet that must be resolved, but the actual experience of the reader. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's so fun to see everyone do this. I'm, I'm geeking out. It's so great. I love it. Thank you, everyone. Um, this is so wonderful. And I would now like to introduce Ginny Loopy. And <clears throat> I have teased Ginny that she is the mother of all of us artists here in New Hampshire. Uh, she is the director of the New Hampshire State Council on the Arts. And she is an optimist, a slave to her cat, who might make an appearance, maybe, if we're lucky, a geek, a connector, and an artist. She's been a fierce advocate for all of us, especially in this time, and she is here to deliver some updates and information from the council. Thank you, Amanda. I am so honored to be here tonight with our artist laureate, Amanda, and our poet laureate, Alex, and all of these extraordinary artists. It really is an honor, and you all give me so much hope, especially on what today was a difficult day. Um, but we've got a lot of things going on, and there are a lot of things to be upbeat about and hopeful about. So um, we received a lot of applications for our artist emergency grants, and um, those uh, applications will be evaluated in the next couple of weeks. And the State Council on the Arts will meet on May 20th to approve recommendations. And, um, and then notifications will go out about those grants. So if you applied for one, please be patient. We are working on that. Um, we are also working on guidelines for um, organizational emergency grants um, that will be funded through CARES Act funds that we received from the National Endowment for the Arts. And I am hopeful that we'll be able to announce that program uh, by the end of next week. So that is in progress as well. And finally, the uh, state's economic reopening task force has been meeting regularly, and you've probably heard the governor in his press conferences announce various little guidelines for reopening. And so on Thursday, of this week at 1.30 p.m., they are going to discuss the performing arts. And so I'm gonna put into the chat some information about how you can connect to those meetings. You can dial in and listen. The public is welcome under the open meetings law uh, to be able to listen to these meetings. Nikki Clark, who is executive director of Capital Center for the Arts, will be presenting on behalf of the sector. And even though this meeting is to discuss the performing arts, there will be some discussion about the arts sector um, at large. And so I invite you to uh, log in and listen. And, um, and I'll also see if I can put in the chat in a little bit an email address if you have comments that you would like the task force to consider when, um, as they are developing guidelines for reopening, um, there's an email address that you'd be able to send those to. 
as well. So thanks everybody. Thank you all for being here and let's just keep going. Great. Thanks, Jenny. Thanks so much. So if you are a artist, a performer, a panelist right now in the webcast, you'll be able to see Jenny's um, content and links for that um, event coming up on Thursday, um, next Thursday. But if you are someone who is uh, registered and joining us from your home, not part of the performers or panelists, I'll make sure that you have that information um, for you and I'll tell you where to get it at the end of the webcast. So at this point, um, we would like to invite uh, Sarah Duclos and Renee Martinez to join us with video and audio. We've invited Sarah and Renee here today as what we call field experts. These are also artists and collaborators, but people who are joining us to bring some context and uh, perspective to a larger question. Robin, will you introduce Sarah? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, Sarah, there you go. Wave your, hand, wave, your, wave your hand for us, Sarah. There you are. Uh, so this is Sarah Duclo. She resides in Gonic, New Hampshire, and is a dancer, a coffee aficionado, yes, <laughs> a dog mom, a homesteader wannabe, and right now, an avid puzzler. She is artistic director of Neoteric Dance Collaborative. She's a freelance choreographer and a, teacher, a teaching artist on the New Hampshire State Council for the Arts Education roster. Currently, she's working uh, in that program through the Arts and Reach. She's also a 2020 cohort member of the University of Pennsylvania and National Arts Strategies Executive Program for the Arts and Cultural Strategy. Hey. Hello, thanks for joining us. Amanda, would you like to introduce Renee? Yes, I would love to introduce my friend Renee. This is wonderful. Renee is an educator, a dancer, a mom, She's a New Hampshire Dance Alliance founding board member and a book enthusiast who lives in Manchester, New Hampshire. She's with us today as a field expert, bringing her work in the nonprofit dance sector to light and also her experience as a dance educator. She is the integrated arts curriculum coach and dance specialist at Gilmet Middle School in Lawrence, Massachusetts. Thank you for being here. <laughs> the last time I saw Renee, we had a friend date and we're having a glass of wine and conversation. So it's fun to see her today here official too. Um, so we invited these two women um, to start us off on uh, a question around why movement and language help humans make order out of chaos. And we're specifically wondering in light of your personal practice or your affiliations with your organizations or schools, how you answer that question for yourselves. So Sarah, why don't I start with you? How movement and language make order out of chaos? Well, I think that that is such a pertinent question right now but I also think that that's been a pertinent question for my entire career <laughs> um, because living an arts informed life, I feel I identify as a storyteller and also as a multidisciplinary artist. I work with poets often, I work with language often, and I think that human beings have this need to make sense of the wor world through storytelling. And that's what dance and theater and literature do for me. Um, and I've seen it spark conversation and spark change in communities. And I think that, that those tools are going to be really essential as we move forward to whatever we're moving forward to. That's great. And recently, actually, there's a really wonderful example of that. So on Tuesday of this week, Sarah um, has choreographed a, a dance performance, but it's physical theater and projection and art and collaboration with a team. It's a work uh, for the proscenium called Shelter. Why don't you talk a little bit about that? 
Sure. So Shelter was a production that my dance company, Neoteric Dance Collaborative, produced on the music hall stage in Portsmouth in 2018 as a fundraiser for Haven, New Hampshire, which is a crisis center for survivors of sexual assault and domestic violence in Stratford and Rockingham County. They, I have been involved with them for a number of years doing artistic performances um, to raise funds for them. And Shelter was sort of the final iteration of that. Um, it, it has a dual sto storyline. It tells the story of crisis centers um, beginning in the United States in the 1970s and also a modern day storyline of one woman's experience with a domestically violent relationship going into shelter and going out of shelter. We were really lucky to have this recorded and have a nice um, digital rendering of this performance. So we, when COVID came around, um, you might have heard this in the news, those of you who are New Hampshire residents, but this is happening all over the country. Um, COVID-19 is really affecting people who are in abusive households because we're all sheltering in place, but not every home is a safe home. And when I started hearing about those instances of domestic violence being on the rise in communities throughout New Hampshire, I thought what a brilliant opportunity this would be to bring shelter back digitally um, and raise some much needed funds for Haven as they make adjustments to their services. It's a really um, perfect example of how you express that sort of need right, for um, storytelling in the context of movement and language. And this was one example of your work doing this, um, um, having this kind of uh, need and focus. Renee, um, can you respond to that question in your work in your life? Sure. Um... So when I think of the word chaos, um, I feel like that often defines my life. Um, and I think it does for so many of us, not just in this period of, of isolation and quarantine, but also just in the fast paced nature of our world and our society that we're currently living in. And for me, I think words and movement um, both are what um, help us connect with other people, um, but also that specifically um, there are so many mixed feelings and emotions that come with chaos, no matter what kind of chaos it is. And a lot of people um, are really great at expressing those emotions and um, processing those emotions with words. Um, but there's equally um, a large number of people who aren't able to do that. Um, and it's through body language that um, people are able to express, process, um, relieve some of the stress from chaos. And um, I constantly think about my students um, who, who come from um, some really um, unique homes and situations and um, Across the board, um, not just at my school, I feel like um, teachers are experiencing all sorts of really interesting um, behaviors and lack of um, coping skills um, with some of our kids right now. Um, and, and that was pre pre COVID. Um, and I feel like being attuned to, to not just the words that that kids are expressing, um, or even adults for that for that matter, but really, really um, looking at their movements because often, you know, our bodies are able to express things that we are not even able to recognize sometimes. And, and um, I think movement, in addition to, um, you know, using our words to connect with people, um, I think that's really what we need um, to make the connections 
to express feelings, to help identify and process our feelings, um, to make to make sense out of out of this crazy crazy world around us. I see it with my kids all the time too now. So um, your own children, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I'm going to invite all of the poets and dancers to light up their video and um, be ready on the audio so that if you have a comment, you can join us. But Jeff, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit here. Um, I'm going to also chime in real fast and just remind any attendees as well, as if anyone has any questions in the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A box. Feel free to pop the question in there and I can relay it to any of the panelists. Yeah. So uh, I wanted to hear um, Jeff's um, experience right now. Um, he, like Renee, um, has kids at home and is navigating um, the behaviors and the language and the movement and also the confinement of living with um, different age family members. I'm wondering what you're thinking about language and movement right now. Yeah, I'm thinking a lot. Um, first of all, this this was this has been so great. It was so great hearing everybody's work and seeing the the movement to go along with it. So nice job, everyone. That was amazing. Um, yeah, so I have a I have an eight year old and a ten year old, and I mean that's really what my my poem was about. You know, just every everything is everything. <laughs> um, I mean, and and it's it's funny because it, it always has been. You know, it's it's like that. In some ways, nothing has changed. You know, everything is still kind of perfectly connected. But I think we can see all the connections now, and we it's like there's less boundaries and more boundaries around us. We're like in this contained space and there's no boundaries within that space. Um, so, you know, as a parent on one level, it's kind of amazing. You get to spend all this time that, that you didn't with your, with your children and you get to be their teacher, but that's a really hard job that I don't really want, <laughs> you know? Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's, I, I, the, the thing I've been thinking about a lot, it kind of appreciating this that, that you put together, is just kind of the limits of ra rationality and reason. You know, I mean, we can we can sort of we, we we can reason our way through this. Like this happened for a reason. You know, these things happen because of globalization and and science and all these things. But at a certain point, to make sense of it, I think we need art. You know, it's there there there's a there's a limit to our ability to understand this or feel. Uh, I think we want to feel differently about it, and I think poetry, movement, you know, all of these art forms are, for me, feels like that's what I need. And so I'm not a, I'm not a, a dancer, but I really like dancing with my family. And that's something we've actually been doing a lot because it's kind of like, what else are we going to do? Like, we can't, I can't watch, I can't read about Trump right now and I can't talk about this anymore. So I think we should probably just dance. <laughs> It's awesome. So all of you who are here, um, we're going to work this conversation as it feels right. So if you, is there anyone who'd like to respond to that or share their own experience? Renee is, yes. <laughs> yes, Mrs. Martinez. <laughs> yeah. So um, as an educator and, and arts advocate, um, you know, so many of us have felt, um, that figuring out where your place is, right? Whether it's um, within your career, whether it's in your community, um, oftentimes as, as an art teacher in, in a public school, <laughs> we get um, pulled out um, when, when times are hard. And what's really been interesting is um, I'm finding, at least in my own situation, um, students have always validated the need for arts in their lives. There are students who, who come to school on the daily because they're, they're going to that arts class, whether it's music or dance or theater or, um, you know, and, and I feel like in, with the situation that we're currently in, I, I feel that others are starting to recognize and validate the need um, and the awareness of the arts around them. I, 
you know, we all know as artists that art is ingrained in, in everything we do, in everything we have, um, in, in the way we express ourselves, but the awareness isn't always there. And so I feel like that this situation, like Jeff, Jeff mentioned, I think there are just so many of us that are making that realization that we are creative. We're all being forced to be creative right now. And, um, and we're all using the arts in some way as, um, you know, that, that mental, emotional health um, right now in this, this crazy time. Anthony. Hello. Yeah, I want to piggyback off that um, because it reminds me of what's going on, you know, with, in my life. So I was in the middle of opening up a business and it's still going to be open, but it literally smacked me in the face. was like, dude, your plans, you got to get more creative. So, you know, piggybacking off that, it actually inspired me. So, you know, I always tell my little mentees, I always tell them, I go, Corona didn't happen to us it happened for us and it was those you know that moment to look at this as leverage you know we have to think outside the box how can we still connect through these screens these glass boxes right and um i guess be creative with it and you know we've done so many different low-key programs on social media with these kiddos and i've got so much response where they're like yo i felt so inspired i can't wait and these kids are now tapping into other things because don't get me wrong like if you want to be a dancer go for it but i truly do believe you need to uh instead of drinking from one same pool drink from all types of waters right to make your art better and now these kids get it and they're kind of just like whoa i'm gonna start studying some filmmaking some uh master classes and stuff and i'm like that kid knows how to cook what so you know, now it's a time, especially in the youth, to see these kiddos realize that, you know, and like Jeff was saying, it was the awareness. And I feel like, again, we have to hit rock bottom to, to see the difference, right? So, um, yeah. yeah. That's great. I think there are these, like, very hopeful, like, innovations and experience and pockets. And that's exciting. But I think there's, like, I also want to give um, the mourning, like, and the death and the fear it's due. Because I think um, for people who joined us last time, we were talking about epic failure. And one thing that people talked about was how success and failure aren't on opposite ends of a spectrum. They're actually seated right next to each other. And so there's something about that here in this situation where our fear and our hope are landing so close together. And something that's been interesting for me is people are like, well, Amanda, aren't you dancing? Aren't you making so much dance? And I'm like, I don't feel like dancing. I feel like crying. I feel overwhelmed. I don't know how to take care of my people. Like, I'm not dancing right now, right? I'm wrapping my arms around people, um, but I'm still missing my practice. I'm, I'm seeing added value, but there's sort of, there's something elusive there. There's some impasse um, that I can't, I can't articulate, but I'm wondering like Maria, Kelly, Nick, you've cultivated these practices, right? These daily practices of, warming up the body of working with clients of touch what's it feel like what's happening now kelly yeah. I'll jump in. so as a as a rolfer my job every day is to tune into people's nervous systems on a pretty intimate level and help them feel oftentimes they're coming in with physical pain so to help them not be in pain but then to help them with their body awareness and their movement patterns and all of these coordinated things that ultimately help us, you know, feel better in our bodies. So not, my practice has been closed for seven weeks now. And it's been, I've noticed that it's been really dysregulating in my nervous system because I don't have that space, which is very similar to dance to me um, of, tuning into other people's nervous systems and, and helping them. So I, I'm very much missing that. 
And similar to um, Amanda, I've been dancing, I've been teaching still via Zoom classes and I've been dancing a little bit, but it, it hasn't been every day, um, which is not normal for me either. Um, but in the moments that I'm feeling, you know, we're all riding this wave of, I think every day I go through like the whole spectrum, maybe not every day, but often I go through the whole spectrum of like, oh great, I'm waking up and feeling good and motivated. And then I get an email from the unemployment office and it goes like down the hill. And so there's just these constant waves of emotion and, and I'm that are totally out of control in my environment right now as everything has been like stripped from normal. But I'm constantly um, brought back to my movement practice, whether it's specifically ballet or my somatic practices through Rolf movement. And I'm so thankful to have uh, the, my body and movement as a resource because in those moments, whether I'm just laying on the floor and rolling around or being outside in, in the woods, um, I can feel like those connections and those relations and sensations in my own body. And I think as artists, um, whatever type of artist we are, we, we have that awareness already, whatever our avenue is. And if we just pay attention to present moment sensation, what's really happening, our body has so much intelligence. And I personally find that to be um, a really grounding resource in these times. And this is what I do with my clients all, all day, usually. <laughs> so it's a good reminder for me to also, also slow down and really practice this in my own body. Um, so that's, that's where I'm at. I'm, I'm thankful for, for movement in general in, in my life so much right now. Yeah, thank you. That's great. Yeah, Nick. Um, so for me, it's been like a whole mental game. And how can I get the points across without me touching the body? And the imagination is such a powerful thing. Um, so being a personal trainer and a dance teacher, um, being able to communicate what I'm envisioning with my hands on their body, trying to adjust, and what could make sense for them. So really stretching my imagination out. So it's like more of an internal workout than an external workout for me now. Um, which is really kind of a mind twist because you're always thinking, always on the go. And like, you know, you just got to wake up every day and just like tell yourself you're ready to crush it. You know what I mean? Like this is the time where the light just needs to shine out of you into this world, no matter whether it's the arts or just the life. Um, you know what I mean? It's, it's the power of the imagination and the mind that's really getting me through this. Um, and so that's how I relate to it. Like with the movement is I need to get what's here to there, almost like telepathic now. Mm -hmm. um, just like imagination talk, like I said, like a Pilates roll up. You all roll a rolling pin with pie crust and then you have to roll it out slowly down one by one. And my client was like, huh, I never could do that. And she got rid of that jerky motion. And so being able to translate that and like hear how that's really gonna become a part of my practice is really awesome. So I really love this, I mean, I don't know. It's definitely a journey. It's definitely a journey. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah. The, and to control the mind is a difficult thing to do. <laughs> Nick has been working on that for a long time. I know. Maria, what's it feeling like for you? Oh man. I mean, speaking to your point, it's a, it's a lot of grief right now thinking about the rest of the world. I'm so lucky that I can come up to New Hampshire and have this space. But um, in my own personal life, it's a lot of grief too. You know, I just came up on my one year anniversary with Paul Taylor Dance Company. And Amanda knows this has been my dream job for since I was forever, <laughs> forever <laughs> since I came to this planet. So um, it just came to this screeching halt and I was just getting momentum and I was just feeling comfortable. And uh, that was my whole world. And um, so although I, I am so grateful that I'm safe and healthy and my whole family is safe and healthy, that, that, was, that was my life and every part of it. Um, but speaking to the power of the arts, just doing this event right now, it feels like if I could make an analysis of it, 
is it feels like I just had the most nutritious meal ever <laughs> that my body needed so badly because no matter where you're doing it, a huge stage in New York City or anywhere in the world or in this living room, anywhere you're doing art and you're allowing your pores to absorb all of it, it doesn't matter. It shuts out the, the rest of the world for a moment and it feeds your soul. And um, that's what that just felt like. And dancing to Alex's words, like that was nutrition that my mind needed, my soul needed, my spirit needed. And I know that when the Zoom call ends, I will take that with me into as long as it stays. So I think that's, that's the only way I can articulate it is that it really just fed me. So it's so, so important. Awesome. That's awesome. I'm so glad you're here. And I'm also really excited that you're dancing for Paul Taylor. Let's just talk about that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I owe so much of it to Amanda. She has been great in great mind for so, so, so long. <laughs> it's so I, have awesome. to tell, I have to, if we have time, it's the, the sweetest story, Amanda. I'll make it super short. But I remember dancing in the church in Sandwich, New Hampshire with Amy Marshall when you were dancing with her. And at the end of it, I knew right at the moment I wanted to dance for Paul Taylor, I think I was 14 or 15, at the end of the performance, Amanda came up to me and she put her hands on my shoulders and she said, you're going to be a professional dancer, it's written in the stars. And that <laughs> has stayed with me for every second of my life. So there you go. That's <laughs> while I cry. <laughs> Thanks, Maria. That's so awesome. Yay. Yay. Good things. Um, so Sarah wanted to have a little comment because I think this is kind of a nice piggyback. Like Maria, you're talking about there's like grief and we kind of talked about this conversation around sort of mourning and Sarah wanted to have some comments on that. And then we have which people who are signing in to listen to us aren't seeing this amazing chat box, but there's some stuff happening behind the scenes. And I wanted after Sarah talks, maybe to kick over to Liz, because Liz was talking about thinking about chaos and not how to make order of it, but how to sit with it. And I think these two kind of comments might um, be useful. So Sarah, why don't you take it away? Mm. Try again. Uh, oh, wait, you're back. <laughs> you're back. You're here. R rural internet, everybody. <laughs> um, it does sound like our, um, our thoughts are probably going to go together, Amanda, because when you were speaking earlier and some of the dancers were chiming in about that morning, that sad, you know, I spoke about shelter earlier, but I didn't decide to do shelter like at the beginning of quarantine. Like that took me a couple of weeks to come to. And I saw so many of my artist friends around me like immediately throwing up online shows and doing workshops and doing all of these things. And people were asking me what I was going to do. And I was like, I'm doing nothing. I'm snuggling my dog and really sad. Um, you know, early on, my best friend's grandfather died, um, a grandmother rather, and her grandfather also got COVID-19. Like it was just incredibly concerning to me. And um, right when quarantine started, Robin mentioned earlier, Uh oh, Sarah, we lost you. Frozen. Frozen. All right, so we can't hear you, hear Sarah. Me? Oh, can you hear you? Did you hear me? Yeah, yes. I you. Did I cut out? You did. Hi. You're back. Now. What was the last thing you heard me say? <laughs> We're talking about a friend who had a loss. Ah, okay. Um, so, yes, it. COVID really affected me early on in quarantine in a negative way. And um, it may also at the beginning of this, 
national art strategies had a convening that was supposed to be in person in Philadelphia, but ended up being an online experience. And during that, we talked about creating, co-creating artistic experiences with communities by listening to what they need and not exerting our expertise upon them. And as I saw all of these people creating art around me so, so quickly, I saw a lot of that exerting expertise going on out into the world. And not that I'm saying that I'm so great for sitting around and waiting to do a project like Shelter, but I think that right now is a great opportunity to listen to what communities need and how the arts can help, how poetry can help, how dance can help, and take that moment of stillness before taking action. Thank you. Yeah, I think you're right. It's really, really wonderful. Liz, um, do you want to respond to that a little bit and maybe talk about what you don't totally have flushed out just yet? <laughs> Up, oh, you're on mute still. <laughs> it's just part of the chaos. Um, I think I was wondering about um, this dichotomy of, of order and chaos. And um, I, I'm so uncomfortable with the uncertainty that's before us. Um, and I mean like a very personal uncertainty, but also uncertainty as to you know, the place that I work and like the future of X, Y, and Z. And um, cause I feel like I could really hunker down for a good long time if you gave me an end date. And I know I'm not alone in that. Um, and so I guess I'm wondering about how, how language and movement might help us um, become acquainted with that chaos a little more intimately or more comfortably um, to sit in it, to behold it. Um, I don't know. I, I, I think that's what I need in some ways. I don't know how I'm going to get it exactly because I'm really struggling with it. Um, uh, with that, with that uncertainty. And, and I'm curious to know how, how the arts in general and how my art of language of poetry in particular might um, take me in a new place because it has to, because my relationship to time is fundamentally altered. Uh, and to like, so like the span of time and like my movement through time just feel so alien to me now. And, and if I think about writing poems too, I think time is involved in writing poems, this idea of um, movement forward in time, of duration, of tempo, which now that I say those words, I think they're very much connected to movement as well. Um, so yeah, maybe I'm thinking about relationships to time. Interesting. And also I'm hearing too, like, you're not necessarily making a choice like choices are being made for you yeah. like you said i'm having to do this because i have to not because you want to or you make the choice mm -hmm. to, yeah. right yeah that's interesting you know so mike that makes me think about you and your poem because there's that reclaiming right of the word corona um what are you what are you thinking right now <laughs> I was more I was more thinking about um movement. Everybody's talking about movement. Um the reclaiming of the word was really important to me um and to kind of find some something positive about it because I feel like at the same time the terrible thing happens, there's also something beautiful happening. I think that's always true. Um uh, to quote Star Wars, um, the darkness rises and the light to meet it. Uh, but um, going back to movement, I was just thinking, um, what was I thinking? My son, uh, when, I, when we hang out, normally before this, we were 
we we're always going somewhere. We were going to the movies or we were going to an arcade or we were going someplace inside. Um, but now we've been driving around in the woods and finding these little trails that are all over the place around here. Um, it's like you don't have to go to just all the way to the White Mountains. There's little, there's little paths into the woods everywhere and we're driving to those places and we're going into the woods and we are moving more and I almost feel like we're talking more and we're, we, li we both like the same kind of music and we're listening more music and, and we're moving more. And it's, and I, I feel like part of the problem of that we're having right now and even before all this, when you talk about global warming or whatever is, is a, an issue with our connection and respect for the natural world and uh, getting that connect, connection back, I think is, is massively important. And that's how I feel like we can't really just go back um, to the way it was and the, uh, all the information about, th that's the most stunning thing to me is clean air and water over around and around cities and all over the world. It's, that's incredible to me. Um, that's telling us something, you know, we don't want to go back to that. You know, we don't want to go back to all to the mess. It's like, we have to figure out a better way. So anyway, and it starts maybe by getting out in the woods more and feel like, Hey, you know, this isn't just a, this isn't nothing. This isn't just the, the empty space that surrounds our buildings and our homes. You know, it's like, this is, this is real, this is life, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Alex, do you have something that you'd like to add? Well, so for me, I teach in Massachusetts and a lot of my students are going through some real suffering. I mean, real suffering. I, I think in New Hampshire, we're kind of, we don't have, we don't see many signs of things happening, whereas my students in Massachusetts, but so I listen to them and I mean, I'm a practicing Buddhist. And so every day I sort of think about, you know, the present moment and it's expanding and different types of experiences. But so I'll just relay something I'm going through. I haven't actually told many people about this, but, um, so, you know, I've got a job, thank God. I'm gonna knock when I say that. I've got a job, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm got a healthy family. Nobody's sick in my, my kids and my husband, everybody's healthy. Um, but that said, you know, I worked um, super hard to get a grant for this summer to spend time with my family who I only met for the first time last summer in Germany. <laughs> And um, I'm supposed to be there this summer working on a book, interviewing people who survived the bombing that my mother survived in 1945. I found an apartment still standing on the street, which had been decimated in 1945 by the British in this particular German street. They're all old. Um, there's not much time. <laughs> and this whole COVID thing, it's just, it's like a spear in me because I'm going to have to pull the cord this week and say that to Airbnb and to my airfare and to my grant person, I can't go. And that seems so trivial compared to everything everybody else is going through. But when I got the grant, I sobbed. It was probably the most meaningful thing that's ever happened to me. And it's just every day for about a month now, it's been like a sword in me twisting. <laughs> But that said, you know, I walk around and I'm, you know, I cry a bit and I've got other things going on, but I realize, I don't mean to be like dorky when I say this, that um, it's taught me something the last few weeks and the need now to make this decision to cancel this, um, this dream come true. I mean, I'm 50 years old. I don't know my family. This was my one opportunity to know my family, right? Um, it's taught me something. It's really balanced out my perspective because I realized that I'm half American and half German and I never give any credence to my American family. And suddenly I'm starting to reach out to cousins who I've never talked to in my entire life, my flesh and blood Americans or spending more time with my dad who's uh, probably dying of cancer that I don't spend, I don't spend much time with him. 
And suddenly I'm realizing from a Buddhist perspective that I put so much value on meeting these strangers who are in a photograph to my right right now that I met for the first time last summer, that maybe ultimately it's a problem in my own perspective that I had this value just about imbalance and, and that I had to let go of it. And it still makes me want to cry. So I'm still upset about it. Um, but I understand that it actually was teaching me something I had to let go of in some weird way. So that's really what's going on with me. And you're probably the first set besides my family to my husband, and my kids to know this, but it's been hard, you know? And then I think about, you know, poor little me, you know, poor little me who can't go to Germany for the summer. Whereas my students, they have no form of support. They can't pay for their bills or, you know, they're, um, uh, frankly, one of them is a stripper and has a bunch of kids and she can't do any more, you know, stripping, which is how she pay pays her bills. And these are my students where I teach. They're really rough working class kids and they have no way right now of supporting themselves. And they're so depressed. I can see it on Zoom. And here I am with my little, I can't go to Germany this summer feelings, you know. So it's it's been really interesting. Like I think Liz was saying that sort of, you know, you had a word for it, Liz. I'm Pardon if I don't have the what you typed up there, but you were talking about hammering. I think you used the word hammering, didn't you, Liz? And every morning I wake up and I, I practice this mindful writing technique and whatnot. And it's like this balancing act with my ego and letting go of things. But Liz put it so well. What did you say, Liz, about hammering, if I may ask? Um, I said, what did I say? Um, to try not to bend the chaos into order, but to try to encounter the chaos, the uncertainty, to try to survive it, but not by hammering it into something else. Glad that resonated for you. Which is actually, I think, what all creatives are wrestling with, COVID or not. It's like that honesty and authenticity inside of a story. It's like, it's equity, it's truth, right? Um, whether it is devastating or joyful. And um, so thank you, Alex, for sharing that. Yeah, uh, thank you, Alex. And I, I, I just wanna add too, sorry about it. Um, mm -hmm that it, I think it's important that we all remember, we all have the right to grieve. Uh, and it's really, because I teach at Boston Conservatory, so I have a lot of those families and those students on Zoom that it's just Boston got hit mm. hard. Uh, it's nothing compared to what's up here. It's just insane. Uh, so many faculty members are, we're getting a students for having it. It, it, it. Students were petrified to go home. It, it's really, really something. And so, yeah, seeing that and like, here we are, I'm nestled in a little seacoast New Hampshire with not many people and yeah, it's hard, but talking to them, they actually reminded me, you know, it's, it's okay. Like we have to be able to, we have to allow ourselves to be upset and so we can get over it and use that as the art, use that as the focus, use that as the impetus to push off to something else. Uh, but I don't think we should deny ourselves it. And you have every right to feel angry about that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so we are actually at time and I want to respect everyone who's joining us from afar on. So I'm going to conclude, but if, um, and we'll be able to stop the recording, but if people want to stay on to have a little conversation, I bet we can. But for those of you who are chiming in, um, I have a website that has a blog. And each time I do these things, the people who are engaged as presenters, artists, panelists, I brag about them on the blog. So if you want to know how to email these people, you want to see work samples, you want to connect with them to hear more of their poetry, or you want to hire them or give them money, um, go to leadwitharts.com. You'll be able to click on the blog and have extended bios, work samples, and how you can connect with them all on the socials. It's right there. Um, I uh, have been so lucky to engage with these people in various ways and they've made my life a better place. So I encourage you to 
um, check them out um, deeply and see what they're doing. They're smart, kind people. Um, thank you so much uh, for joining us here and stay tuned for the next creative campfire. We uh, can't wait to meet again.